So this will, I will try to make it as technical as possible, so apologies if it sounds like too deep of a dive, but I want everybody, so like you have, I have 20 minutes, so in 20 minutes you'll learn what plasma cache is, how it works, where it works, where it doesn't, and why it's the, the most like viable like solution currently, at least at the current research levels, because the, all the other solutions, I'm of the personal opinion that they're quite, let's say, optimistic and, and ambitious, and it will take some time until we have them like in production. So, where's my slides? Yeah. So, who knows here how Plasma Cache works, like has tried implementing it in a, in a low level, essentially? Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, the point is that um, the other Plasma constructions, the original Plasma paper, the, it was very, very important because it gave the notion of what Plasma is. It should be like the Satoshi's vision thing, Vitalik's vision, whatever you want to call it. However, <clears throat> it was like totally unrealistic. It has this whole map reduce construction. It had like a bunch of like a, the dream of the tree of chains and now everything communicating with each other, like the, the Supreme Court. I don't, I'm not of the opinion that it works. So this talk will be highly opinionated on what I'm thinking, how Plasma is and works. So take this with a grain of salt. This is not expressing the general, let's say, um, opinions of the plasma community, I guess. So, yeah. <laughs> test, test, one, two. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the point is, okay, anyway. Um, the thing is that the plasma, it works like with the classic sidechain construction. You have like a main chain, the sidechain. You deposit your funds, you do whatever you like on the sidechain. You can take them out. But the thing is that in order to get scalability, we actually need a consensus mechanism that advances faster than the normal mechanism, than the base chain uh, mechanism, and you cannot do that, like, in my opinion, by definition, you need to, like, make some compromise on either decentralization or the security aspect. And so, uh, what we're doing is that with Plasma, you construct essentially a non-custodial sidechain, because at any given point in time, if there's some invalid state transition, you can go through this exit game, and you can, like, just get your money out within a certain um, uh, challenge period. Um, yeah, maybe, how do you handle this? I'm not exactly sure, like, yeah. I have like a bunch of nice like shapes and all that to explain it. So like the whole difference um, between like plasma cache and like the other variants, it's because the plasma cache, it's non-fungible. It is, it is in the family, let's say, of plasma protocols that it's um, the security is enforced by the non-fungibility of root chain deposits. So each coin you deposit it has a unique ID. It's different from each other. And you can use it to have a sort of um, like a simple exit game where like each coin is unique. You don't have to use the whole priority queue uh, construction to go through your, um, what do you call it, to make uh, multiple exits. There is no need for the mass ex exits construction, which is like very important because currently um, all the other plasma, non-plasma cash variants designs, they require mass exits. And I will make the claim that the mass exits currently aren't viable due to how like, uh, let's say, primitive, like the, our signature aggregation works on the, we cannot verify enough. Even if you do a, a multi-signature and you compress it and you do a threshold signature on all of them, you cannot actually, like, verify the whole thing on the EVM. Yeah, and, like, uh, okay, okay. So, uh, Jeff just said, like, explain why Starks are better than XT-based checkpoints and whatever, or RSA accumulators. So, first of all, quantum resistance. Okay, so the argument is, um, Plasma Cache has a very big, uh, let's say, disadvantage that uh, whenever you're passing coins around and as the sidechain pro uh, progresses, the coin history grows linearly. Uh, so I have 10 blocks, I need to pass around 10 blocks worth of uh, proofs, and this sucks. So what we can do is, one, we can just pass around the proofs, two, we can do checkpoints, but, uh, which is a very brilliant construction by Kelvin. However, this thing, it's, it requires so much social coordination, it's like on the level of the mass exits, and I'm not sure if it works. So uh, on the contrary, what you can do is that you can use the RSA accumulator, the RSA accumulator's recent construction, which you like assign a unique prime number to each leaf, and you make some black magic on it, and you can somehow prove compactly the, that the coin's history is valid. And the final, the very sexy alternative, is that you can just take the whole history, you make a stark proof, you put it on a, on a black box without any trusted setup or anything that you don't like, and just have a compact proof that can be transpar that can be transmitted to your receiver. And actually, in these cases, we never need an on-chain verifier to do that because uh, I'm just I want to prove, like let's say to Jeff, I just want to tell him that you know I have this coin, take it, and he proves it on his own. 
and the verification is really very fast. And yeah, quantum resistance, because we need to be like anticipating the quantum computers. They're coming to get us. Well, where's my slides? Yeah. More, more qu yeah, Q&A, exactly. Yeah, yeah, more yeah. questions, please. So actually, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can answer like any question. technical question, so hit me with your best shot. And if I don't answer, yeah. Why do we need to worry about quantum resistance if we're not even sure if the systems work yet? Like we're gonna we're gonna iterate Plasma cache multiple, works. multiple times. Plasma cache is real. Is it, is it because that's it's gonna exist in perpetuity for a long period of time, and then future quantum computers? I mean, that generally it? we need to be like looking ahead, and like protecting against. Uh, like, so to rephrase, if we can have a quantum resistance scheme in one year, I believe it's much better than investing six six months in a non-quantum resistance scheme. So I'll just chime in for a second. So I think the danger is, is if we encrypt all this data and we have like our browser history encrypted and then somebody gets a quantum computer, we're all screwed, right? More Q&A. Okay, so how do you get started? Firstly, Kelvin and friends have done like a great, great, amazing educational effort with a site called lelplasma.org, if I'm not mistaken. But I am of the opinion that, um, where's the timer going if I don't have slides? <laughs> Mm. Um, but I am of the opinion that uh, I literally cannot show you how one thing works if I literally point you like to, if I give you 10 links, it doesn't work that way. So I've been writing a plasma paper, like, okay, I will talk about my work, right? Um, I've been writing <clears throat> a sort of plasma paper that it's like a 20 pager that you read in maybe two hours and you can like understand everything about plasma, this variant that I'm working on. So you read it and basically you should be having like a pretty good idea of what's going on. And implementing a Plasma contract isn't actually the hard thing. Implementing the client software is the hardest thing. Because the smart contract, you need like, you define it like you give it, like you need to do this for exit, this to withdraw, this to deposit. That's all there is to it. And you add the submit block function to commit the Merkle root, and that's it. <clears throat> but the client software, it needs to watch, it needs to <clears throat> cache state, because if you pull the Merkle proof, you need to save it. Because if you don't, like, and you restart your client and you don't have the proofs, you assume that the, whatever entity is providing you the data, they will provide you the data. And if you do that, why even bother with Plasma? Which is, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are some like Plasma variants that assume some sort of data availability, and you shouldn't ever assume any, any kind of it. So yeah, just read, learn Plasma, and like, I'll, I'll give a link to the paper at the end, yeah. Anything going on? More questions? Yeah, more yeah, questions. just anything, anything, seriously. Yeah. So I do not work on MVP, but again, my opinion. Uh, I do not think light client verification works on MVP. I'll, I'll put very contrary opinions, so always with a grain of salt. So uh, I, MVP, it requires you to validate the sidechain state, which by definition, it contradicts the scalability because if you need to do full client validation on the light clients, you can never run like a, a secure plasma chain on your phone. You can never like validate the secure plasma chain on your phone. And you need to do that because otherwise you cannot be sure that the plasma chain is not a fractional reserve. Like if there is a withdrawal also from mid and you didn't take note. So yeah, that's why like I'm a very bullish on the plasma cache because er everything that happens on chain, you know at that moment. So, okay, plasma cache, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so why is plasma? You have the main chain, the side chain, like you deposit some funds, you do the funds, whatever you like. We talked about this already, so I will skip this through. Uh, the big detail that we need to like uh, insist on is that each block must be submitted and the gas costs for this, they kind of stack up. I actually really like this purple color, it's very satisfying. So um, you checkpoint each block and the moment you consider transaction finalized, this is like a security property, that you consider transaction finalized once the block root has been committed and the witness data, the Merkle uh, branch for that transaction that you're looking for is made available to you. Because if that data is not made available to you, you literally cannot know if the transaction was included or it was censored. So just a moment to just say that Plasma Cache is real, it's working right now, it's live right now, you can do npm install like this thing, you can run this command, these are two real addresses and you can get, connect to RinkyB um, via Infura or your own node, but nobody runs their own nodes unfortunately, but yeah, uh, shout out Bitcoin. And, um, this is like how the thing like looks from the inside. You type help, you have a bunch of commands. The user needs to do the very, very minimal amount of things. You just need deposit, transfer, exit, withdraw. That's all you need to do. I'm of the opinion that you never should like force the user to do anything regarding watching. It's all on the client software. 
And yeah, whatever. Like you can demo it if you want. Like I won't do a live demo because it's total like hubris. I, it, it doesn't work. So okay, I've written this thing. Like you should try to read it. Give me feedback <clears throat> and so on. Um, uh, I'm basically trying to do what I said before. I'm trying to do a very like comp concise overview of how Plasma Cache works and what's it about. And uh, soon I will have like some more like formal notation of how the exit game and the finalizes and the state transitions work. So. First of all, like, why? It's real, we can do it like in pretty realistic time frames. I believe that I started working on it on May and we had like an implementation within a month and a half, so it's real. Um, we have low data requirements for the light clients. Like, okay, it's not really low, but it's lower than any other available solution, so I will claim it's low. And you can have like this uh, modular architecture where if anything that you don't like, you just add the plugin. So this whole naming convention thing, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it also. So uh, I believe that this is a very good quality slide like to like get people to understand like what are the differences of each variant. So the ones that we are working on, and much thanks to Ranji for, maybe I said the name wrong, um, to, for all the discussion for this, <clears throat> is that the, whenever you deposit the coin on this variant of Plasma Cash, each coin is unique. So you have this, like, uh, this gives you like a very simple exit game, and uh, it's very like, uh, the, the security is tight. And what you can do is that, uh, but it has some problems. It doesn't have like fungible payments, and it doesn't, it, the, the history grows like hell. So what you can do is that you can either like use some magic like uh, RSA accumulator zero knowledge proofs to prove the coin's history in a more compact way. Uh, and the other thing is that we need to like, if we want to do like fungible payments with multiple ones, you can apply the other technique that you break a coin down in 100 pieces, and you have the user transferring the, the sub pieces of it, and whenever you're speaking about a coin, you're actually talking about a range of coins. Or just use state channels, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, very, I'm a very big fan of state channels from Plasma, but we'll talk about that later. So <clears throat> the other variants, there are the Plasma MVP ones, which uh, I argued earlier that they require too much data. And they also require, the, the, they also require a sort of priority queue construction for exits. Because if the operator, the operator is basically able to create a huge UTXO which exits the whole chain, which would make it a fractional reserve, and you need a mass exit, which to my knowledge, there is no working mass, mass exit scheme to date. And uh, on top of it, you can add the more viable plasma, which Kelvin has thought of, to like solve, to make UX better, and maybe most viable plasma one day, I don't know. And uh, yeah, you can use NARCs to verify the state transitions from like one thing to another. So currently what we have um, is uh, that uh, we do transaction routes. So anytime you submit a block, you don't actually submit the state route, so it's not the latest state. So you need to like go literally to the whole block history. Well, in this case, you just have the state route and it's like it's there. You know it's there because you have this whatever black magic box that um, it, it proves your um, assumptions. So uh, I'm pretty sure this is a good taxonomy on like which are the variants of plasma. And there are, okay, uh, to be fair, these are the variants that are based on payments. Um, <clears throat> the, payment, the variants that are based on smart contracts, uh, I'm not well informed on them but they're very fun. So uh, to do like a quick technology primer, so the main data structure that we use in Plasma Cache, it's a sparse Merkle tree. It's basically a tree with, which has all the, it has like whatever leaf uh, amount uh, you want. Um, it's all pre-computed, so it's all like in the default values. It's the hash of zero or whatever null value you want. And to prove the inclusion of an element, you do it in the classic way that you just provide the Merkle branch with the siblings and everything. I'm assuming that people know how a Merkle tree works. And uh, the fun part is that you can actually prove non-inclusion by giving a proof of inclusion of the zero hash, of the hash of zero at this leaf. And this is very convenient because we can, this is what basically makes Plasma Cache work. And uh, you can actually have some very nice optimizations on top of this. So because all the values are pre-computed, when I'm giving the Merkle proof, I do not need to give like 32 bytes every time. Whenever I, ha I want to give the default value for a sibling, I can just give a bit field and this, like, it's literally one bit versus 32 bytes. And in this very simple example, so like instead, normally the Merkle path it would have been hash of zero and the, and the higher level one, so it's 64 bytes, while with the optimization for the bitmap, it's two bits. And much love to the Walk team for thinking this up and uh, having a working implementation. So the usual suspects. Uh, Alice deposit five ether was like the actual flow, so, pardon me. So Alice deposits like five ether to the smart contract. 
the smart contract emits some deposit event that the plasma chain listens. The plasma chain is supposed to create a new block, one new block per deposit. This is not a security requirement, but it makes proving, like it, it's an optimization basically. This has been asked a number of times. You just deposit the coin and you get a new block. This isn't necessary, but it's better. And um, what it does is it creates a plasma block and you get literally a, a, a five ether bill, if you will. And the thing is that uh, the transaction flow, it's like UTXO based, but it's one input, one output. I cannot break a coin, I just say new owner and that's a new owner, um, just like cash, yeah. So I'll just go through a simple like example of how the deposit the transaction flow works. So deposit Alice deposits the five ether. I like the five ether example. So five ether like it just appears. Alice gives the coin to Bob, but the thing is that at this moment, Bob must actually verify that the coin's history is valid. And now let's consider that there is a new block where Alice does it, where Bob, who is the latest valid owner of the coin, doesn't move the coin. And uh, if Bob wants to give the coin to Charlie. Charlie must not only verify the inclusion in block one and two, he must also verify the non-inclusion in block three, which is why the, I, was, I spoke before about the non-inclusion proofs in sparse Merkle trees. And he needs to do that because considering the fact that there might have been a transfer from two to three, the two to three would make the two to four a double spend, and we don't want double spends. So yeah, and he does that, and he exits by by providing an ancestor. Um, there has been some discussion lately that there might be a way to optimize this to not require an ancestor, but I'm not sure about the safety of it. If you want to evaluate it, fine. But I haven't been able to evaluate it. But basically, the thing that we know that works currently is you give it a coin and the parent coin, and you use this to exit. And I will go over the exit game, the the game that's played like very soon. So uh, the whole plasma constructions, they work based on a challenge period, like the classic dispute period where I make a claim, I put up a bond, I wait some amount of time, and if nobody challenges, yeah, it, my, my claim must probably be right. Right, it's all like crypto economics, I hate that word. So um, the, the time currently and the bond amounts are totally arbitrary. I'm of the opinion that somebody just wrote the first MVP implementation, maybe it was David actually. Like uh, it just put like seven days for an exit period and everybody said, that's it, the holy grail. Or maybe Vitalik say, I don't know. But the point is that currently there has been no game theoretic, like proper analysis on like what the deposit, the, what the challenge period should be and what the bond amount should be. And I'm very interested in that. So if you have any research on that, please speak to me. And uh, yeah, so this is like a good takeaway from the presentation that um, we model each coin as its own state machine. So state machines, like it's yeah, we have the initial deposited state, and basically you define a transition function that whenever you want to go from one state to another, some certain things need to happen. And what you do, it's simply like, whenever you want to go from deposited to exiting, you start an exit and you put up a bond. The start exit, you put whatever proofs you like, it doesn't matter. And there are two types of challenges. The one type of challenge is the interactive one, and the other is the non-interactive. So I'll speak about the non-interactive, which is simpler. So the non-interactive challenge it is essentially I see a claim and I instantly challenge it and the exit goes home, like it, like it never happened, right? And uh, it's a simple form of challenges. However, the interactive challenges, essentially, in order to finalize an exit, it mustn't have any pending challenges, any outstanding challenges. So what you do is I start an exit, somebody else challenges my exit, and in order for me to be able to finalize my exit, the word exit has been said too many times, you need to actually respond to the exit. And like you have, let's say you have a counter, a challenge counter that goes up and down, and the only way to finalize it is when it's at zero. Um, I hope this slide is clear because it's like more or less the whole like construction of how it works. And now I'll talk about the challenges. So uh, I'm hoping things are clear so far because like this is where we're getting to the examples. Um, let's say that Alice has a coin at block N, whatever you like, and uh, Alice spends the coins, she gives it to Bob or whoever else, and Bob maybe then gives it to Charlie. So the thing is that Alice isn't forced to exit from the latest state. She can always go to a stale state and just say, I'll exit. So yeah, she can do that, but the thing is that she needs to wait seven days or whatever to do the exit. And at that point, another entity, they can challenge by providing a spend. So Alice essentially makes the claim, I'm the latest owner of the coin, and the other, the, and then and then the challenger comes and says, no, you're not, basically. That's the whole thing that you need to know about it. And this is the one type of attack that you can do. And this shout out to Carl because he did like a very good like specification which explained all that stuff. I used it, you should use it. Um, the other alternative is that you do a double spend. So the example I was talking about before, uh, I was considering the fact that the Charlie the, the, or Alice Prime 
not plasma prime, um, is actually like uh, it's not a colluding party. So what can happen in this case that Alice gives the coin to Bob, and Alice, in collusion with the operator, they double spend the coin. So they give it themselves, some other friend of them, whatever. And what happens in this case, if Charlie wants to exit the coin, he needs to provide the parent, as I said. And the whole like uh, exit game here, it works that you need to provide the coin that is in between. And this actually proves the double spend, because you say, no, I owned it before you did. And yeah. And uh, the final example of uh, um, like the exit game is that when you're exiting a coin, you actually, so when you're receiving a coin, you actually validate the whole coin's history. But what if you don't? So I want to stress that in this example, like. Try to imagine that the red arrow doesn't exist. Um, it exists, but it's like the response state. So uh, let's say that Alice gives a, has a coin, and that the operator, they collude with some party to give a coin to Bob. So they make an invalid state transition. Uh, so to say, in Plasma MVP, if an invalid state transition happens, the whole chain has to leave, which isn't possible, seriously. So what you do is that if somehow Alice, somehow there's a transaction that gives the coin to Bob, and Bob starts transacting with this coin, this is an invalid state. And uh, if Bob, Charlie, Dylan aren't malicious parties, they will check the coin's history, but they're trying to steal the coin. So Dylan tries to exit, and at this point, at the seven day period, Alice can say, no, I am the latest of the owner of the coin. In this example, what you can do is that you can actually respond to the exit. So this is the interactive challenge. The previous two, they were non-interactive. In this one, when you make an exit, when you make a, a challenge, you leave also some amount of time to respond. Because if Alice made an invalid um, exit, an invalid challenge, somebody would, should be able to respond. So that, that's there where the red arrow comes in. That you should be able to bridge, essentially, you should prove that there is actually a spend from Alice to Bob and it validates her, uh, um, her challenge. And there can be a number of these. So you can have like multiple challenges with invalid histories. And the final result is that you want it to be, uh, you can only finalize the exit when it has zero challenges. So um, from my experience, like towards building a, a client, like uh, it has been a pain to actually like keep, like on the implementation part, it has been a pain to like actually keep the Plasma contract and the Plasma chain in sync because uh, you have essentially a cron job with some bits blocked to the main chain and uh, to the Ethereum, whatever you want to call it. And the thing is that you have to make, essentially you, you mustn't make any synchrony assumptions. At any time, like any state that is in the chain, it must be checkpointed. But if there is a delay, or if for some reason the the, um, the cron job submits a block twice, your chains are out of sync. So your the main chain contract gets at block 10, and the plasma chain is at block 9. So that's that's bad. And that, and that also relates to the second bullet point, that uh, whenever you're listening, so the plasma chain actually listens for mainnet events to actually like modify the state. And you need to apply them in the right order, because if you don't, the state will be botched, and so it's a problem. Uh, on the client side, so this was on the operator side, let's say, to have a, a correct, honest operator software. Uh, on the client side, uh, you need to also, like, whenever you go offline, you need to save the block that you went offline, and when you go back online, you need to check everything that happened while you were offline. And it's like, it sounds like bad, but it's like actually what happened with full nodes, but I guess it's our approach towards full node, but we like, very light clients. And yeah, I'm very much of the opinion that you need to keep the client light. If you need to store too much data on it, it's bad. But also, you need to be able like, yeah, just cache the data. So if you download some data, just keep it there and don't discard it. This may sound obvious, but yeah. Um, yeah, so we should be able to do better. So currently, this is like, uh, better is the enemy of good. Good is good enough currently. It is workable, it is done. But we want to do better. We want to reduce the two main problems that we want to solve is reducing the coin history and making fungible payments. And this is pretty much what the Plasma Prime construction is. So I'll just give a brief overview of what happens. So the non-fungible coins, it's a double-edged sword because it gives you this nice security properties, but you have like, you cannot make the payments that you like. So the one approach is that you have a change provider. So I send Jeff like seven ether and gives two back to me. But you need an atomic swap construction, which before Plasma Prime, Plasma Prime, the, 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 the dream, uh, it didn't exist. 
And the other uh, approach, it was the Plasma Debit by Dan, who I love Dan, but he's not here, yeah. Um, uh, plasma Debit, which basically, like, instead of a coin, like, having a certain value, you can have any value between zero and that value. And you can think of it as a liquid, like, uh, a liquid that goes from zero to that, to its max capacity. And essentially, if you're able to reduce the one, like, liquid by a certain amount and increase the other one by another amount, essentially, you have simulated a transfer from these two. It's very neat because it also has the notion of uh, transferable payment channels. Because if I have a coin, if I own a coin that is like with some balance and I transfer it to somebody else, it's essentially that guy who has now, or, or girl, who has the payment channel now. So it's very, very convenient. And the final approach, which is the cash flow defragmentation prime, whatever, uh, is that I deposit like one ether, and instead of depositing one ether, I get 100 0 0.01 ether coins. And I can move them around and so on. But the problem with that is that if I have, let's say, like 10 coins in a row, and I send the middle coin, suddenly I have two, like I have two uh, subtrees. And the whole uh, technique, the efficiency of this technique, is that you can exit multiple coins by exiting a subtree, by proving it with whatever magic. And uh, yeah, and the other approaches, like how will we reduce the history, right? So firstly, the checkpoints, TLDR, it's like, you have a coin and you, instead of validating from its deposit, which is like what, 10, 10 million blocks ago, you validate up to the last checkpoint, so you pick the checkpoint, uh, um, the range to be like manageable. However, um, I claim that this requires too much social coordination because it involves the operator advertising. It's, it's complicated. And uh, the other approach is that you can like simply like mes make less frequent commitments, but this um, hits on your throughput and your capacity. Because if I have like, uh, you basically say that if I have like one gigabyte of history and they commit one time every 15 seconds, it makes sense to say that if I commit one time every minute, the coin history goes down by one fourth, by, to the one fourth. Uh, the other approach to use the probabilistic uh, structure is the bloom filters, but if the bloom filter has false positives and it was shown recently that you can actually like pollute the, pollute, yeah, the bloom filter, yeah. Uh, another approach is the accumulator. So with the accumulators, what you do is that the goal with the accumulators is that you succinctly prove the inclusion or non-inclusion of something. And you use either RSA accumulator, which is the current like uh, approach that people like, or there's another alternative, which is pairing-based, which uh, I would like to discuss at the Plasma Call Live later. And uh, the final uh, thing is that, yeah, the, that magic black box, the uh, Snark Stark uh, toolkit, which I was at the Stark uh, presentation yesterday, and uh, it, I was informed that it is possible to actually do batch proofs and everything we need, like with Starks, in a realistic time frame. So that will be like lovely if we can have it. And uh, yeah, okay, there is this other thing. So currently, the UX sucks. You need to wait seven days to exit the coin, if you need to exit the coin. My opinion is that you don't need to exit the coin, but it must be there. <clears throat> so what you can do is that you can li literally like tokenize the exit. So I make an exit, instead of like owning the exit, I can get an ERC721 or whatever non-fungible. Um, and they can sell that around, and whoever owns that coin, it's like a coupon, and you can send it, and you can, after the exit period has passed, you can withdraw it. And uh, the whole construction is that uh, this creates a whole market for exits, where uh, instead of like, pay, if, I, if I'm exiting five ETH, essentially somebody else is probably willing to buy my coin for 4.95 ETH, because they have a lower term preference. And this part, it makes sense to say that it will be the operator, because they're running the chain, and they don't care. And they also run a full node anyway, so they, they know what's valid and not. And the second one is the optimistic exit. So uh, instead of exiting, so when exiting, you need to provide Merkle proof signatures, whole lot of stuff. It's a lot of data, so that the gas can go from 100,000 to like 200,000, and maybe more, depending on your proof size. Uh, alternatively, what you can do is that you can assume that the exit will be valid and add one, one, one more challenge, the cryptoeconomic uh, approach, which is it's nice because like, you can essentially reduce the cost of an exit like 60K gas, like for two store operations. But um, you, you, you add another challenge and uh, yeah. So the final takeaway from this presentation, uh, the technical stuff, it's, it's solid, like you should look into it, it's not complicated and talk to me for learning about it. Uh, Plasma doesn't improve finality, so this whole one million transactions se per second uh, dream, it's, it's not real. What you do is that you increase the capacity that you can force per, th per 15 seconds. Because currently, if Ethereum can handle like what is it, like nine million gas per block or eight, uh, what you do is that you 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 can put the whole information that happened on the plasma chain in 32 bytes. And storing 32 bytes is cheap. 
So if we had like multiple plasma chains, yeah, okay, the scalability it can be one million transactions per second, but it still settles every 15 seconds if the data is made available. And yeah, essentially, just think of it as a compression, literally. Maybe not because you assume a decompression mechanism, but the thing is that you just take everything, you put very little data on it, and if you follow some certain rules of the protocol, like watching, you're good. And yeah, it's a non-custodial sidechain. Um, thank you very much. And these are the repositories. Go check them, break it if you can. Yeah, uh, yeah and have it take any questions. Maybe, is there a microphone? Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, w what's the problem with allowing atomic, multiple transactions to be atomic within one plasma block? Because you cannot force the operator to include both. So what you can do is that you can construct a, a, a game where one transaction is depend, what you want in atomic swaps is that, atomic is a bad word actually. So like, either both happen or none happen. Right, so this matches your exchange use case, I guess. So <clears throat> the operator, you need to force them if they include one transaction, that either they must include the other one, or if they include the one and they don't include the other one, that one is invalid, right? And you can do this by essentially like doing a two-step game, with just like similar in the classic atomic swap construction between chains, you just you commit to a pre-image and you give the pre-image to each other and you reveal, but um, yeah. Maybe Carl is better to ask like in depth on how the atomic swap works because I haven't been looking at the prime how they how it's being done. It's one more question. Okay, quick if it's quick. Okay. So uh, I'm from Doc. We are a data exchange protocol, uh, and we were trying to enable micro payments using Plasma Cash, and we did a POC. So we came up with that approach, but I want to know your thoughts. Uh, how do you think micro payments can be enabled using? Plasma? Why don't you want to use the payment channels? Is uh, my question. You have the engineering toolkit, and you need to use the right tool. I do not believe that Plasma is the right tool. Okay, Plasma Cash, you know. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't it's matter. Not, okay, yeah, so yeah. you're saying using the uh, state channels probably is a better way. Payment channels. Payment channels. Yes. Okay. I think Georgios needs a lot more credit for actually implementing Plasma Cash, which is pretty amazing. So thank you, Georgios. <laughs>